All the animals come out at night. Whores, buggers, queens, fairies, dopers, junkies. Sick. Venal. Someday a real rain will come and wash all this scum off the streets. I go all over. I take people to Rainy. South Congress. I take them to Round Rock. I don't care. Don't make no difference to me. It does to some. Some won't even take Redditors. Don't make no difference to me. Do you know what it's like to live in a city that stinks so much it gives you a headache? To be in a place where violence and degeneracy run rampant? Travis Bickle does. And on top of all of that, he's suffering from sleeping problems. Let's face it, he probably got PTSD from his time in the Vietnam War as a Marine. He works long hours as a cabbie to deal with it, working nights, going anywhere with anyone. Bickle sees New York for the abyss it is. And the longer Bickle stares more into the abyss, the more it stares back into him. Will this darkness consume him, or will he rise above it and defeat the evil? Taxi Driver opened in 1976 at the Cannes Film Festival, winning the highly prestigious Palme d'Or Award. It found critical and commercial success, being nominated for a handful of Oscars, including Best Picture. It not only stands as one of Scorsese's finest films, but is one of the greatest films of all time. So today, let's dive deep into Taxi Driver. It's funny that Taxi Driver is now seen as the epitome of the Literally Me movie, as the writer of the film, Paul Schrader, has stated multiple times that Travis Bickle is literally him. Well, him mixed with Arthur Bremer and Oliver Stone. Therefore, I think it's important for us to understand Schrader if we want to understand Bickle. He's a prophet. He's a prophet and a pusher. Partly truth, partly fiction. Walking contradiction. In the early 70s, Schrader's life was going just great. He was married. He was an apprentice of the legendary film critic Pauline Kael. He was also working at the American Film Institute. And then, he divorced his wife. He left his mistress, he stopped working with Kale, and he quit the AFI. For a while, he found himself in a deep depression. He couldn't sleep due to his depression, so he wandered the LA streets at night, drinking to excess. In this time, he found himself growing a fascination with guns, and he'd spend a ton of time in porno theaters, as they were the only things open at four in the morning. No doubt, a level of sexual frustration and addiction was also probably at play. Over the course of a month, he lived this kind of nocturnal lifestyle, staying in bed until 5pm only to embark on his daily nighttime odyssey. He didn't eat, but he did drink. A lot. The event that put an end to his self-destructive lifestyle was the formation of an ulcer. The searing pain and the hospital admission was a much needed wake-up call for Schrader, as he realized that he couldn't continue down this path he was on for very much longer. As a form of self-therapy, Schrader wrote Taxi Driver. The script practically wrote itself, with the writer finishing the first draft in only 15 days. With this screenplay, Paul made a story out of his depressive period, with the protagonist, the lone taxi driver, floating around the hellish city in his metal coffin. He didn't intend for the script to be his breakout screenplay, but once it fell into the hands of the up-and-coming new Hollywood director, Martin Scorsese, his fate was sealed. Now, to be fair, Schrader had sold his script The Yakuza for a whopping $325,000, but the movie flopped in the box office. Taxi Driver is a film that brought prestige to Schrader's name. I've got to give props to Robert De Niro for his performance in this movie for a few reasons. For one, De Niro had since blown up in popularity due to the success of The Godfather Part II, and so his going rate soared to $500,000 per picture. But he had already signed on to Taxi Driver for a salary of $35,000. He could have negotiated negotiated for it to be higher, but he stuck with the original sum. Also, to his credit, he put in the work. He worked as a taxi driver for up to 15 hours a day to get into the cabbie mindset, and he also interviewed Midwestern military men during his breaks while filming Novo Cento so that he could tape their voices and mimic the flat Midwestern accent. That voice would become one of the defining features of the film. Well, who the hell else are you talking? Are you talking to me? To think that Dustin Hoffman almost got the role. I mean, I love Hoffman, but he would not be a good Travis Bickle in my opinion. I don't want to get too lost in the details on the production, as I'm prone to do, but I just want to say that, from my perspective, the film seemed to just come together so perfectly. They shot in the sweltering summer and during a garbage strike, so there was just tons of grime and trash all over the streets. New York in the 70s was already kind of a gross and dangerous place, but it was heightened for this film. And one last thing before I get into discussing Bickle's character. The original script had all the bad guys, Sport, the receptionist, and the other people associated with the brothel as black. 
Scorsese changed it because he thought that it would make Bickle's character come off as more racist than anything else, which wasn't the intention. Honestly, he made the right call. I couldn't imagine how film YouTube or film Twitter would talk about the film now if that change hadn't been made. There's no escape. And God's the only man. Taxi Driver is, at its heart, a film about loneliness. But it's more than just that. It's an exploration of loneliness and how it can become pathological. What do I mean by this? Think of it like this. Was there ever a time in your life in which you felt sad, lonely, depressed, or all of the above? and you kind of liked it? For as bad as all of that made you feel, you still reveled in it and even made active choices to make matters worse. There is a comfort in loneliness and alienation. It takes time and energy to build relationships with people who may be great additions to your life, or they might ruin your life. So you put all this effort into forces that you can't control. It's much easier to control every aspect of your life if you just don't depend on anyone for anything, even friendship or basic companionship. If you care so much about controlling your life and making sure that no one can hurt you or change you, then it just kind of makes logical sense to have self-destructive behavior when it comes to your relationships. You don't let anyone get too close to you, and you especially don't let yourself get too close to anyone. You can blame society for making you an outcast, and yeah, society at large probably does play somewhat of a role. But at the end of the day, you are responsible for how you handle the cards you've been dealt. Travis Bickle is guilty of this attitude. He's a fish out of water, a Midwesterner in New York, and a Marine among civilians. But he doesn't try to form any meaningful relationships. He interacts with people for a living, sure, but they're just short-term fellow passengers in his yellow chariot. They're what the protagonist of Fight Club would call single-serving friends. That might even be a stretch. When's the last time you had a meaningful connection with your cab driver? Even among the other cab drivers, he doesn't go to great lengths to befriend any of them. When they're eating, he sits on the edge, slouched in a pose that's not welcoming, and he barely talks unless one of them brings him into the conversation. He does try to form a relationship with Betsy. He spies her working for the Palantine campaign and can sense that she's another lonely spirit, just like him. And, just like him, she's a lonely soul, despite being surrounded by people all day. It feels paradoxical, but the loneliest I've ever personally been has been in cities. It's like being in the middle of the ocean and needing a drink of water. In a pretty alpha move, he asks her out, not just in the middle of her work, but in front of the man who is obviously in love with her. But the relationship doesn't last long. He takes her on a nice date in which he buys a piece of pie and melted yellow cheese, but the second date doesn't go so well. Where are you going? The Kino Corner said this was a good movie. I mean, I don't know much about movies, but he told me this was good. I mean, a lot of couples watch it. I could put in another movie if you want. Listen, fellas, I'm no dating expert or anything, but it's not a good idea to take your girl out to see an adult film on the second date. Why do he do this? He says that he sees other couples doing it and that he thought it was just a normal thing to do. We can take him at face value here. It's obvious that he spends a lot of time at the CD cinema and his overexposure to these adult films might have desensitized him. However, I find it hard to believe that even the most socially unaware person would think that this was a good idea. The way Bickle tries to mitigate the situation is by comparing the adult film to just about any film that's out there. Sure, a lot of films in the 70s had tons of sex and nudity and raunchy movies were becoming more mainstream. Hell, Deep Throat was a box office hit. But come on, he took her to a cinema that had hookers just outside the lobby. My thinking is that he might have been intentionally sabotaging the relationship. He was afraid of getting too close with someone or opening himself up to someone. We know that he has a hard time talking honestly about himself when he goes to the wizard for advice. I just want to go out and, and, you know, like really, really, really do something. He just babbles and babbles and can't give a straight answer as to what's bothering him. Maybe he sees that if he's to continue this relationship with Betsy, then he'll have to open up to her. So he executes the relationship early on before that can happen, but immediately regrets it. My favorite shot in the film is when he calls Betsy on the telephone to vainly attempt to schedule another date and salvage what he once had. The camera trucks to the right, revealing an empty hallway, highlighting his isolation and emptiness. 
His anger towards himself, his life, the world, the state of things, everything, manifests itself as a kind of existential anger. He has all this pent up rage that he hasn't been able to process. It's like a ticking time bomb, just waiting to go off. But what will be the consequences? It's Scorsese himself who introduces the ideas of guns and violence to Bickle as a possible way to solve his problems. It's not only a great scene, but it's got a meta quality to it, like the artist is reaching down into the art to influence the subject. Anyone could have played the character, but Scorsese playing it made it more special. Bickle stops his porn consumption. He eats healthier and adopts an exercise routine. In his small, dingy apartment, Bickle transforms from Travis the cabbie to Travis the warrior. In the meantime, Travis takes on a couple new obsessions, the politician Palantine and the child prostitute Iris. And so he must choose between a destructive or a constructive path. The destructive path is that of political assassination. Why is our hero set on the destruction of the politician he had once admired? Is it that he associates Betsy with Palantine, and thus his own failings as a man? Or is this attempted act of violence one against the system as a whole? What would his assassination accomplish? Would it actually cause an actual positive change in the system, or would it just sow more chaos? Would the act be for the benefit of society at large, or would it merely be an act of egoism on Bickle's part? I think the latter. The killing of Palantine would mean the destruction of Travis, with his last cry to the world being one of anger. Now, onto the sorta constructive path. Bickle first encounters Iris when she hops into his taxi in order to get away from her pimp, Sport. Her pimp then throws a crumpled $20 bill at Bickle to keep him quiet, but the taxi driver holds onto that note and uses it later as a ticket of passage into Iris's world. What he sees appalls him. A 12-year-old girl being used and abused by sport and anyone with enough money. Judging by her putting excess sugar on her food, she might also be addicted to dope. Bickle can't stand the sight of this and he immediately wants to save her. If he saw Betsy as a Madonna who turned into a whore, then he sees Iris as a whore who has the potential to return to being a Madonna. He wants initially to have it both ways, to kill Palantine and save Iris by giving her several hundred dollars, but we all know that that money would be wasted. So when he decides to call off the political hit and instead channel his violent energy to save Iris, he chooses the path of creation. He becomes the rescuer cowboy instead of the villainous gunslinger. It's no coincidence that he wears a King Kong patch. Bickle is a lot like Kong. He's doing what he thinks is the right thing to save both Betsy and Iris, but he's doing it in a clumsy and destructive way. So even if I'm saying he chooses the better path, it's still a messy one. But even though he chooses to save Iris, he still wants to die. He downs a bottle of pills and, at the end of the gunfight, he tries to shoot himself, but he's out of bullets. All he can do is point a finger gun at his own head. In a way, he does die. At least, the rage-filled, lonely man inside him dies, so that he can be reborn, start anew, and reintegrate back into society. In the end, he saves a girl by killing some gangsters, pimps, and lowlifes. He becomes the hero of his own story, only for him to go back to his life of driving a cab. The important thing is that he focused on what he could change, rather than what he couldn't. Now, I'm not advocating for anyone here to attack a brothel in your city or whatever, but just to think of the film more metaphorically. Maybe we can change our depressive mindset by focusing on the things that we can change, like how we treat other people, how physically active we are, what job we have, how we dress, how involved we are in our communities, or any number of things, rather than focusing on the things that we can't change. It's easy to wallow in sadness and blame systems beyond our control for our own failures or lack of happiness. But to pointlessly lash out at them is fruitless and can sometimes and oftentimes lead to our own self-destruction. We have to make our world better before we can make the whole world better.